Make you choir. And that was just a sneak preview, so come tonight and hear the whole thing. Can you imagine, with whatever your holiday schedule has been, add multiple rehearsals into it and learning an entire cantata, and then you have what our choir has been doing just for us. When it comes to the Bible, say the name of Joseph, and you can almost always bet that the person everyone is going to think of is that guy with the coat of many colors, the Technicolor dream coat, the one in the book of the Bible that started it all, the story of Joseph in the book of Genesis. But of course there is another Joseph who was a part of the beginning of something really big. This one is the Joseph from Nazareth, from the house of David in Bethlehem. This is the Joseph who is most often overlooked. He's the character nobody wants to play in the annual Christmas pageant. And for good reason, I know, of course. But you know, what are you going to do? He was the earthly father of Jesus, but he is the only major player in the Christmas story who doesn't have a single line. Not one. He doesn't get to say anything. Mary gets to sing a song. Elizabeth gets to make grand and joyous proclamations. The Magi from the East, the angels, even the lowly shepherds. Even Zachariah, for heaven's sake, he didn't have a voice for nine months. Even he gets a line. They all get their moment in the light shining from the star. But not Joseph. It is only Joseph who says... Absolutely nothing. But that is, of course, if we are thinking he can only speak with his voice. Because Joseph actually says a great deal. He just says it with his life. And we can hear him if our hearts are willing to listen. Will you pray with me, please? God, our mother and father, here we are to worship. And here we are, like Joseph, in the midst of the struggles and challenges of life, wondering what on earth we are doing or should be doing or want to be doing, not knowing what to do. And here we are, God, like Joseph, faced with a choice of whether or not to listen the angels you sent. So God, in this time, especially, we ask that you would help us to hear your voice, receive your message, God, that we might help bring Christ into our world. And it is in the name of that Christ child that we pray. Amen. All week long, I've been wanting to call him Joseph, International Man of Mystery. <laughs> I'm not sure really just how international he is, but he is most certainly a man of mystery, especially if we're looking for details about him in the Bible. There are precious few, and the reality is that we really know virtually nothing about this man chosen by God to be the earthly father of Jesus. We don't even know how old he was when he and Mary were betrothed. And we don't know much about his profession except that he worked with his hands. The word in Greek used to describe him as tekton, which is the root word of technical or technology. It's usually translated as a carpenter in the Bible, but really it was a general term that could describe anyone who worked with their hands and with any kind of material to make things like with clay or with stone, or he might even have been a builder. The one other thing we know about Joseph, though, for sure, is that he didn't live long enough to see Jesus and do his adult ministry. The Gospels imply that Mary was a widow, which is why when Jesus was dying on the cross, he looked down, and he looked at his mother, and he looked at his beloved disciple, and he said, Woman, behold your son. And he said to the beloved disciple, Behold your mother. Jesus was the only one left to take care of Mary, which must have meant that Joseph was no longer in the picture. And that's pretty much all that we have about Joseph, except, of course, what we hear of in the Gospels of Matthew and Luke. Not coincidentally, the only two Gospels that tell us the stories about the birth of Jesus. 
Today we heard, as Diane read for us, from the Gospel of Matthew. And the very important detail that Matthew lets us know about Joseph is that while he may definitely have been a man of mystery, he was almost certainly a man of great dreams. Four times we are told in the Gospel of Matthew that God sent angels to Joseph in his dreams to guide him. The first time, of course, is when Mary is pregnant, it's what we heard about today. And the scripture says he is a righteous man and unwilling to expose her to public disgrace when he discovers that she is pregnant. And so he just plans to put her away and dismiss her quietly. But the Bible says, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, don't be afraid to take Mary as your wife, Joseph. And so he does. And then Jesus is born. And then an angel of the Lord comes to him in a dream and warns him that Herod wants to kill the child. And he should take his family to Egypt and remain there until further notice. And so he does. And then, many years later, after Herod dies, an angel of the Lord appears to him in a dream. Do we sense a theme here? And tells Joseph to take his family and return to Israel. And so that's what they do. Except when they get there, Joseph discovers that Herod's son is now in power. And so he's still afraid. And so he has a fourth dream in which he is warned by God to go to this little backwater area called Galilee, to a little wide spot in the road called Nazareth, where no one would look for them, most especially the government. And that's the last we hear about Joseph in the Gospel of Matthew. And these four dreams may not be much to go on, especially if we're looking for the good stuff, the juicy details about Joseph. And while they don't give us much of that, they actually speak volumes about the one thing, the one Christmas gift that Joseph has to share with us, which is this. God speaks to us, and when God speaks, we should pay attention. Joseph's message to us, not with his voice, but with his life. God speaks to us, and when God speaks, we need to pay attention. Joseph clearly paid attention. He took what the angel said very seriously. The angel said to Joseph, don't be afraid to take Mary as your wife. So he woke up and that's what he did. Joseph, when you wake up from this dream, scoop up your family, get them to Egypt where it's safe. He woke up and that's what he did. Joseph, it's safe now. Bring your family back to Israel. He woke up and that's what he did. Oh, but Joseph, go to Nazareth. And guess what? That's what he did. Joseph may not have made it into Jesus' adulthood, but at least Jesus had an adulthood because Joseph paid attention to what God said to him. Yes. And Joseph was able to keep Jesus safe so he could grow up. Are you with me? Mm -hmm. yes. It would have been so easy to not pay attention, wouldn't it? To not take his dream seriously. It's just so easy to get distracted. Are any of you like me that you think, oh, I'm going to pay attention to my dreams. I've got this little pad of paper here by the bed, and I'm going to tell myself before I go to sleep, okay, when I have a dream, I want to wake up in the middle of the night so I can write it down, which, of course, never happens. So then I think, okay, well, I'll write it down first thing in the morning. But then, of course, the dog has to go out. And then, of course, I must have coffee. <laughs> and then, of course, there's the smartphone doing its thing that it does. Same. <laughs> <laughs> and so by the time I get to all that, of course, the nuance and the details of the dream are all gone. Anyone have that experience? Oh, yeah. <laughs> but it's not just the dreams we have at night. Angels of the Lord can show up in all kinds of ways. And it's so easy to be distracted by a million things out in our world these days, not the least of which are our phones. You know, I recently finally laid to rest my old, broken down, decrepit Blackberry. Yay! <laughs> it's true, it's true, it was time. And I finally got a smartphone, which makes me feel anything that's smart. But I am just stunned by how alluring it is and how much it can distract me. 
It can distract me even from Sarah Helen, and that sometimes I'm <laughs> For sure it's distracts her for me too from time to time. So. But we're both just like, wow, we are becoming the very thing we never wanted to be. Two people in a room looking at our phones. <laughs> it is so insidious. You could have an angel of God right in front of your face. But it'd be more tempting to look at Facebook on your smartphone. <laughs> mm -hmm. And it's not just smartphones. It's our to-do lists. It's the constant pace of life. It's even just the voices in our head trying to distract us with all kinds of things. Voices of judgment and fear and stuff about other people and you name it. It's all in there. So much going on that we either outright ignore or can't see or just miss the angels who are trying, trying, trying so hard to bring us a message from God. But Joseph didn't let anything distract him, nor did he discount his dreams and what he believed was being said to him. Joseph believed God had a message for him. Has anyone ever heard the Lily Tomlin quote that says, when we talk to God, we call it prayer, but when someone said God talks to them, we call it crazy. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm not meaning to say, and nor did I think Lily Tomlin was either, anything disparaging about mental illness. But isn't that the truth in our world? We prefer to call it mental illness than to actually say, oh, maybe we really do hear from God. Mm -hmm. Who could blame us? Because angels are really hard to recognize sometimes. You know, in many ways, Joseph had it easy. He went to sleep, an angel showed up, talked to him, he woke up, he did what the angel said. My messages from God are never that clear. How about you? <laughs> An angel in a dream speaking right at you is hard to miss. But sometimes those angels like to hark their heralds in ways that are hard to hear. <laughs> An angel can look like losing your job. Or the end of a relationship you thought you'd have forever. An angel can look like a tidal wave of tears behind your eyes trying so hard to get out so they can finally wash away that grief you've been carrying. Mm. An angel can be a surge of anger in you, trying to get you to pay attention to an unmet need. An angel can be a headline in a newspaper about some injustice that you're just sick of hearing of and you can't believe no one's doing anything and then you realize the angel's tapping you on your shoulder and saying, what about you? Sometimes angels have fur. <laughs> Our dog Simka teaches me something every single day about how to live. Angels can be life events. They can be moments of intuition. They can be things that go past at the speed of light. They can be so easy to miss, but that doesn't mean that they aren't there. Joseph believed that God talked with him and guided him, and this is what Joseph says to us too. God talks to us. <laughs> God has messages for us. And not only do we need to pay attention so we don't miss the angels, we need to take them seriously. Especially we who are in this room, no matter what our sexual orientation. If you are here in this room, welcome to the club where people like to say, God only sends words of condemnation to us. Right. But that's not true either. Right. God speaks to us too. God has messages of love and guidance and protection for us too, just as much as Joseph. And our calling is this, to set aside the distractions of life, even if it's just for five minutes a day, so that we can pay attention. And our calling is this, to say, God, I will take seriously what you are trying to say to me. There's a reason it's hard to do. It's scary stuff. And it often happens in the worst times of life. You know, in all the glittering tinsel and the sweet candy canes and the fudge and the joy of the season and the eggnog and everything that goes with it, it's so easy to forget that God's angel showed up with a word for Joseph during a horrific time of human history, especially for people like Joseph. There was really nothing pretty about the first Christmas. There was poverty and hunger. There was fear and oppression and injustice. There was pain and there was suffering. And it was in the midst of that mess that that 
was when the angels came with Joseph's message that would help him bring new life into the world. And not only new life, but a new way of life for all of us. Because Joseph paid attention and believed. And that's my sermon on Joseph. <coughs> At least, that is all it was going to be. I did have a story I wanted to include about a woman who had a dream that she didn't want to pay attention to, and, and when she did, it was a wonderful thing, but that'll be for another time. <laughs> because there's something else I have to say about Joseph, besides the dream part. Even before he had any dreams at all, there's something really important we must see about Joseph. The Gospel of Matthew mentions this one detail that is critically important to us in this room in 2013. Joseph was a man of great compassion. The scriptures of his day, the holy words that he had been raised on, the religious lessons he had been taught to live by, they all said that a woman like Mary, pregnant, unwed, you either stone her or you publicly humiliate her until she wishes she were dead. But instead of doing those things, Matthew tells us that Joseph was a righteous man, unwilling to publicly disgrace Mary. Joseph was a righteous man. Now I wish so many translations of the Bible would be more accurate because righteous really isn't the right translation. What it should be is just. Joseph was a just man. He knew that it would be unjust to persecute Mary, a woman in that time and place who had absolutely no control over her own body and life, none, <clears throat> that to publicly disgrace her or put her to death for this thing that had happened, however he believed it had happened in that moment, would have been unjust. And so Joseph did something so important. He put Mary's dignity and Mary's well-being above any holy text. All right. mm. Above any letter of the law. He valued her life over any interpretation of scripture. Yes. And here is why I had to say this today. Because it has been a very, very bad week when it comes to homophobia around the world. Yeah. Now, marriage equality miracles in Utah and New Mexico notwithstanding, there have been some heinous things in the media about LGBT people this week. Uganda has just passed a bill. Life imprisonment for those who commit acts of serial homosexuality. And not only that, years of imprisonment for anyone who counsels or reaches out to gay people. Guess what that means for the MCC people in Uganda? Nigeria, the Senate there, just rubber stamped a bill that prohibits same-sex marriage. In Russia, horrible things are being said that should be done to LGBT people. And of course, here in Duck Dynasty, USA, <laughs> Phil Robertson equates homosexuality with bestiality and bases it all on the Bible. And he really points us to the common denominator from Uganda to the Duck Dynasty and everything in between. It is all, all being based on a so-called Christian interpretation of Scripture. Mm -hmm. All of it. And maybe you've been tempted like me to be angry to the point of hate this mm -hmm. week. Mm -hmm. But I ask you to join me in praying for all of these people. You know, Phil Robertson, I don't think he's a bad person, I think he's ignorant. Mm -hmm. Which doesn't mean I don't think he's smart, I think he's very smart. But he's ignorant of ways and study of the Bible that show it at a much deeper level than he knows it. And how I know that is because I used to be Phil Robertson mm -hmm. 25 years ago. Yeah. Yeah. All of these people, they believe what they believe. They believe that they are standing on the holy word of God, but they forget that the one God chose
to help bring Jesus into the world and nurture Jesus through childhood and get Jesus to his ministry was someone who put the well-being of a powerless girl above Scripture. Amen. That is who God chooses to bring Christ into the world. And if all of those folks could just open their eyes a little bit to the angels around them, trying to bring them a different message, they might notice that we are the angels yes. that God is using to bring a different message to the world of God's love. Yes. Yes. Oh, folks, can I get a big ray Amen. Amen. It doesn't mean that we are better than anyone else or special in some way, although I do think our life experience brings something special to the table. Amen. But we are the angels trying to say to any fundamentalist of any flavor, Jewish, Christian, Muslim, Buddhist, although I don't know if I've ever heard of fundamentalist Buddhist. I'm sure they're out there somewhere. <laughs> Fundamentalism is when you take what you call Holy Scripture and you say it is more important than people. Yes. And Jesus came and said over and over again to the religious fundamentalists of his day, you are putting unbearable burdens on people's backs. Stop it. Yes. The law of love and loving your neighbor as yourself is more important than anything else. And that's what Joseph did when he was unwilling I don't know that that word is used anywhere else in the Bible. Unwilling to do to Mary what his scriptures said he should do. Yeah. So remember, let us all remember when we think of Joseph, remember that he was the one God chose to bring Jesus into this world with Mary, to care for and watch over Jesus so that he could make it alive all the way through to fulfilling his calling. The one God chose was someone who knew this, that we should always put love above the law. And Christianity can push the law with the best of them. That no matter what any country has to say about us, God speaks to us. Don't let anyone ever tell you differently. And they aren't words of condemnation. God speaks to us all. God sends angels to us too. And God is sending us as the angels to our world. It is really not that big of a mystery. Amen. Amen. Amen.